Yes, I am. Is it tech? Tech rep, yeah, tech rep in uh, our region specifically, the Syngenta's rep is uh, Jonathan Stevens, who works up in Maine, and um, he is also available for anybody who has any questions. And with that, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which I don't have up in front of me. I've got it up. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll splash the, the it's, uh, so Amy, Amy McMillan from the from our Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Annie, I see you're in there. Yeah, I'm here, and I'm awesome. going to you hear me. Yep. All right. I am going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Good to go. Okay. So I am the pesticide certification and training coordinator at the Agency of Agriculture. So you will all work through me, all the applicators or commercial applicators I've worked with. I see a lot of familiar names on the list of attendees. Um, so I'm going to help people look through our um, USA plants database to help you find the credits that you have, um, how many you may need when your license expires, et cetera. And then also how to find um, online courses, which in COVID are becoming pretty critical to people being able to maintain their licenses. So we have a lot of webinars that are on there. Um, and I'm going to briefly touch on the online renewal system, but um, the, so I'll do that in the end, but you can always do the old fashioned paper renewal. Um, it's, I don't have any issues with that. And then if you had any specific questions with doing the online renewal, when that time comes, please just give me a call because it can be a little complicated. Okay, so this is the where you would wanna start this URL. It's um, on our website. And if somebody, um, you have to navigate through our website to find out how to look up your own credits. Um, I think it's under the first page of the pesticide certification um, link. And so you would basically just click the logon. Oh, sorry. Oh my gosh, I already screwed it up. Wait a minute. Hold on. To get this down. That's for me. And I'll put that link over in the chat for, for okay, folks good. to cut and paste. Okay. So I'm going to actually see if I can get back. All right. So back there. Okay. So here we are. Okay. So you go down to pesticide programs and you can go to applica applicator credit business information. So for example, so here you would put in your private applicator's license or the last four um, numbers associated with your commercial or non-commercial applicator license. So let's try one here, A colleague of mine has a private applicator's license. So you put in your last four digits, some of you um, some of your certification numbers are maybe significantly lower and you search and then you have basically under your search results, you have your name, you have your certification ID, your applicator's number, when it expires, um, how many credits you need and by what time, um, what time period. So the, the uh, private applicators, you have a five year um, interval during which you need to maintain those eight, eight credits. And so that's typically not that difficult to do. Um, those of you that are commercial applicators, you need to do this and you need to get um, 16 credits over a five year period. Um, so then we can go to this other um, tab recertification course locator. <clears throat> and on here, <clears throat> you can see, you can search for an onsite, which there aren't very many these days, online, correspondence, and a webinar. Correspondence is where you will find our pesticide applicator reports. Those are mailed out to every applicator um, that we have the correct address for uh, twice a year, and uh, Sarah helps a lot with that. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you may search under your category. So you can search under 1A, for example, or you can search under tree fruit as well. You can, so that will bring up um, a category specific training. So if we did 1A, let's say, let's do a webinar and let's search. And there it is, today's webinar. And so you can see that you can get two credits for that <clears throat> um, course. And then there's a bunch more that are on there. And so if you want to look ahead to courses that you could, or webinars that you could attend and maybe didn't get invited to, um, this is a good resource. This is a really good resource for that. Um, let's see, online. Online's a little different because these aren't date specific. So it starts off with classes, courses that were offered. Oh, interesting, it doesn't have the date. Okay, so there are several online courses here that you can also use for credits. And I've seen, you know, I'm seeing a lot more of these types of um, courses being used for people to get credits. So let's see, 20, only 24, interesting. Oh, I guess because it's under 1A still. Yep, right, well, that's actually a pretty good option. So right there, if you sat down on some freezing cold winter day, like not today, but you could get all of your credits this way. And then the correspondence is basically, um, our pesticide applicator newsletters. And we have those um, going back to 2009. So um, those are also on our website. So if you want, if you feel like looking around our website and trying to find there's information on recertification credits, um, maintaining your license, you will see links to these old pesticide applicator reports, old and new. We have one that'll be coming out this March. And typically you'll get two credits per report because there, there are quizzes in there. There's a lot of helpful information. And then um, you read the articles and then you answer quizzes and submit them to me for credit. Uh, all right, so that is that. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, Ashley, anyone, does anyone have any questions? The questions would come up in the Q and A is the best place to put them. Oh yeah, in the top, uh, okay. Yeah, and I'm monitoring, I don't see any right now. So if okay, anybody's good. got any, feel free to, to pop okay. them in there. I'm just glad people could hear me and I wasn't talking into an abyss the entire. <laughs> All right, let's see here. So now we go to, um, all right, this is, we have a, um, maybe Terry, you can share that URL on our link, but this is basically how to renew your pesticide applicator license. So we still, we are emailing out renewals uh, twice during the renewal, prior to the renewal season, and then we're mailing out, um, paper renewals to people. So that's just a reminder that um, if you make it have a change of your address, your home address, or if you have, if you have a change of email to let me know that because some people um, aren't receiving them that way. Um, and yeah, okay. So then if you scroll down here. I think your, your screen is frozen seems to be. Oh dear. That's okay. Um, okay. I may be able to. You're on the you're on the uh, pesticide applicator resources. You're back on the VA VAA FM page, right? Oh, yes. But okay. I should be under license and registration. Is that what you see? No, we're you're, we still see in USA plants. I'll just share my screen if that's worthwhile. Oh yeah, it says my my screen is sharing is paused. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Sure. Maybe I'm sharing two screens at once or something. Maybe I should do that. Stop share and start over. Yeah, try that. That would yeah. make sense. 
That'd be better. All right, let's see, share screen. How's that? There you go, now you're in. Okay, so we have, so here there's the how to register, renew your applicator, application FAQs. So you can go through here. It's a little, it's a little, um, okay, do you see this now? Yep. Okay, And good. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, so do you see this welcome to the Agency of Agriculture new online licensing page? Did you click that already? Shoot, no, hold on. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna start over, go back and share screen. Oh, because you opened up the, the Word doc, right? Yeah, where did it go? Uh, where did it go? Uh, I'll, I'll pop it up. I know where, I know what the, there you go. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. So, okay. so you have control over it now, Sherry? No, nope, this is you, that's you. Oh. I want to let me scroll down. Let's see. All right, here we go. Okay, so you it says. Um, so you will either be emailed or mailed your renewal, and so the two pieces of information that you need to do your renewal are your PIN number. These are the things that are highlighted in yellow, and your Vermont ID number, and then you. need to create an account. So I'm just kind of going through this quickly. You need to create an account um, on our USA Plants uh, database and you're going to be putting it in your USA Plants ID in your PIN number. And once you have done that, you will, um, get a shopping cart that will come up in your in your um, screen and all of your license, your license will should be in there um, for people to renew. So it's a little bit, uh, it can be time consuming. Some people have no problem with it. Some people have a little bit of issue with it. So give it a shot when you get your email or paper renewals. And if it, if it doesn't work, just give me a call and I'm happy to help you out. And we can always do it the old fashioned way with a $25 check and a, a signed renewal. Hey, so I see a question. Excellent. How do we know our PIN number? It will be on your renewal. That will be, be mailed. The, yeah, and I always forget mine and lose my renewal. So I just call the office and they, they give it to me. Yeah, so. I'm always, that's my job. So, <laughs> if you know, I am I can help you with um, any of those, uh, any of that information. If you didn't get your renewal, just give me a call. Um, and and at some point in time, you're going to need your license. So, you, you know, it's, it's just a good idea to check online, like when, know when your license expires, have your laminated card with you at all times. If you lose your card, give me a call and I can print another one for you and have it sent to you. Right, Question you about, will we need a new account every time you renew online? And that should, you shouldn't. I don't think you need to. Nope. Yeah. If you, if you save that information, you know, everyone's got that little notepad underneath the computer with their, their info, you can go back to it. I've been going back to mine for years. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Annie. I think we're oh. going to need to keep moving on. Great. Okay, good. Um, Thanks, everybody. Yeah, th that's exactly what our growers were asking for. So um, we will take it from there. So at Excellent. this break, I'm going to now open up poll number one, and this is going to give us uh, just a little bit of demographic information to show us who's around. So the polling is open. Keep this open for just a couple minutes uh, and and take in take in whoever. So if you can see that that just popped up, looking nobody's answered yet. There we go. We're getting we're getting answers. So this works. Well, that's going on, Terry. I think we had a, a question. Um, I'm assuming it was asking what Annie's phone number is. I'll I'll put that in the chat. Um, I'll 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 dig that up. I I don't know if she's still back on with the mic, um, but I'm happy. We should have it written down. Oh, there we go. And uh, and Sarah just put it into the um, the chat. 
Okay, another minute or two for, well, I should say 15, 20 seconds or two to, for the poll. So remember, in order to get your, your credits, and I know some people don't have credits, so I don't expect all 43 people here are going to uh, click on this, but you need to have done, click the polls. Oh, there, you just pushed one over the, over the edge there. Okay, good, I'm gonna end the polling. Okay, if anyone, if I cut anyone off from polling, give me a holler in the chat. You can even write directly to, to me in the chat and I'll, we'll make sure to record that, but we should keep moving on because the polls do kind of keep things up. So one thing that I want to um, highlight before we bring our next speaker on, uh, Judy, who can go ahead and bring up her screen if she wants. Um, I made reference to the, uh, to the NIWA uh, uh, meeting. Oh, look at the, okay. Um, and I just want to do a quick share of some of those meetings going on. All panelists. Yep. Yep. Fine. Why is this giving me? Okay, here we go. Um, for those who are familiar, I've referenced this New England Winter Seminar Series. Uh, this is the, the meetings that myself and others from around uh, the region are uh, coordinating. Looks like Judy just took my screen away. That's okay. I put the link in the, um, oh no, you can do that. You can go shoot, Judy, you might as well get queued up. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, we have a few more meetings coming up uh, for, for the month of March. Uh, Honey Crisp Bitter Pit, Tree Row Volume and Sprayer Calibration. Um, I'll say for that Tree Row Volume one, it's not as boring as it sounds because I'm, I'm bringing in arguably the best expert in North America now that Andrew Landers retired to really help us talk about uh, kind of the, the cutting edge of uh, sprayer setup and calibration and operation. Um, so just want to put a plug in that. I will put that link back into the chat and now hand it over to Judy, who's going to talk about some pretty important critters we need, we should be paying attention to. All right. Um, thank you, Terry. I am still trying to make my slideshow cooperate anytime it feels like doing that. Thank you. There we go. All right. So um, my name is Judy Rosowski. I'm uh, the state entomologist for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And I'm also the state plant regulatory official, which makes me a sort of arm of the um, APHIS PPQ, the uh, US Department of Agriculture's Animal Plant Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine Group. And before I launch into my spiel, I'm just gonna ask Terry, what time do you want me to um, end by, like 1.05? Terry, are you there? You're muted. Yep, unmute, unmuted. Uh, yeah, that sounds fine. Okay, so I might do a slightly higher speed tour, but um, it'll be good. So anyway, um, I work for the state and I am here as a resource for you. And I'm just gonna talk about some invasive insects you might wanna keep your eye out for um, that are coming our way. And when I say on our doorstep and you see that these are hundreds of miles away, you're gonna think I'm crazy. But do remember that these things move through human activity and it can just take one eight hour car ride and they're here in our state. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the European cherry fruit fly, the velvet longhorn beetle and the spotted lantern fly. And I don't know how many of you um, have ever heard of these. I'm hoping some of you. Um, so, sorry, I need to make my participant screen go away, go away. There we go. Um, so the European cherry fruit fly uh, is a terrible pest of cherries in Europe, and now it's made its way here. It was found in Ontario actually in 2015, but it wasn't identified until 2016. And then it was found in the abutting New York State area. Um, and this is a pest that can travel in the fruit um, and we won't know that it's in the fruit because you can't see it as a fruit fly, it's inside the cherries. Um, so it can go to processing plants, it can be moved by consumers um, and by regular distribution. Um, whoop, not advancing here, there we go. It is similar to other uh, fruit flies in the same family, the Tephridae fruit flies. And we have uh, several native species, the Eastern cherry fruit fly, the black cherry fruit, fruit fly, apple maggot. And we don't have this in Vermont, but there's a Western cherry fruit fly too. Um, 
So the larvae feed for four weeks in the fruit, and then they come out and they make a visible exit hole and they drop to the ground where they pupate and overwinter. And I'm gonna show you the damage. And one of the issues with this insect is that it can cause a rot in the interior of the fruit. So rather than just, you know, sort of making some eating damage that might not be visible to a consumer, the, um, you know, this rot makes these things unsaleable. So that is a problem. Um, and this is what they look like from the outside. And um, you can see the exit holes right here and there's a sort of bruised appearance. So one of the good things, if you can say a good thing about an insect is that it just attacks a fruit. It doesn't attack, it's not a defoliator. It doesn't hurt the twigs. Um, but unfortunately, as you know, the fruit is the saleable product. Um, and it, it does really make a mess. Um, so its hosts are obviously cherries, but unfortunately it can also live on honeysuckle. And if there's one plant that's ubiquitous in New England, I'd vote for um, honeysuckles, especially the invasive species. So what you see in the picture over here on the right is um, a yellow sticky trap with this um, uh, lure and it's a uh, ammonium acetate. So it smells like horrible vinegar. Um, and we put these traps up at some orchards in Vermont. And in 2019, the USDA put 150 sticky cards out that they changed every two weeks. And we have not found this pest uh, in Vermont. This is just to show you um, where it is. So there are three counties that are now quarantined in Canada. Um, I mean, in New York state. So it's a, a northwest corner of New York state. Um, but it's on in Canada in this area, and it's also moving around the lake over here. The counties that you see in green are where uh, surveys were conducted in 2018, and that area was expanded for survey work in 2019. Um, and I think I put Lake Champlain over here so you can see where the Vermont border is. So there is some distance for these to travel, but again, it would just take you know one boat ride, one car ride. Um, to get them over here. So the reason I'm showing you this, this is again as the infested area, is I just want to show you in orange, this is the um, range of honeysuckle. So were they to spread naturally, there's nothing stopping them from moving wherever they want to go, basically. But again, I feel like it's human assistant movement that will uh, get them here. So Another somewhat good thing about them is it seems likely that we can manage them the way we would any other uh, native pest fruit fly. Um, you know, our IPM teaches us that we should use, um, we should alternate which uh, classes or modes of action of pesticides um, each time we treat so that we're not just using the same product all the time. And so there are a few different things um, you can rotate through should we ever get these or if you're afflicted with the native fruit flies. Um, and there's also cultural practices, which may or may not be practical if you have a really large orchard, but um, sanitation is always a good step. Um, removing abandoned trees so that you're not having an um, untreated source um, for breeding, maybe using exclusion netting, and also these um, planting a cover crop or some type of barrier that would keep the larvae uh, out of the soil and keep the adults from emerging. So one of the reasons I'm mentioning this in addition to its regional proximity is that the USDA pursued a vigorous policy of eradication. They did everything they could to kill all the fruit flies they could find in that small area of New York where they found them. Um, and then they found out that Canada was not pursuing a policy of eradication. And that doesn't work when you share a border the fruit flies don't respect political boundaries. Um, and then we got COVID. So I'm not sure what the USDA is going to do next, but I don't think they did a lot of trapping in 2020, but New York State will continue to monitor the situation. Um, and again, this is a pest that there are a lot of pathways for it to uh, come into the um, come into our area. Uh, and what can you do about it? Um, keep an eye out for it. If you check a cherry and it's got a disgusting rot on the inside, see if you can find the larvae or an adult and um, let me know if you're getting any stock from New York, uh, kind of examine that carefully. 
All right, another pest um, that also has a regulatory story to go with it is a velvet longhorn beetle. It's a cerambicid. Those are, that's the same group that has Asian longhorn beetle or other wood boring insects, bores into the wood and feeds between, um, you know, below the bark and can girdle trees and interrupts uh, the flow of water and nutrients through the xylem and phloem. Um, this is one of the most commonly intercepted beetles in our ports. So 44 of them were found from in 13 ports from six different countries. Um, and they come in furniture. We actually had some furniture that was sent to Vermont that had them in 2016 that we were able to find and destroy. Um, but you know, they're they're moving, they're moving. Um, and the reason I bring them up is that USDA PPQ is planning to deregulate them. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. I'm just going to show you. So their native range is green. They're Eurasian, um, Russia and Asia. Um, orange is um, countries where they've been found. So it doesn't mean they've infested the entire country. It's just they're present in this country. Germany managed to eradicate them and they're in um, North America now. So the, one of the reasons that um, the USDA thinks it's okay to deregulate them is that they have established populations in Illinois and Utah. So by established, they mean they're reproducing and they weren't able to eradicate them there. Um, and they're, they've been found and are either in the process of being eradicated um, or have been eradicated. And actually that's not true. They've been found and not yet eradicated in a number of other states, maybe 12 or 13 other states. So they, USDA feels that they're um, present in this country. Um, why are they of concern to uh, tree fruit growers? Because they like mulberry, which isn't that important, but apple certainly. And then in Utah, they found them on cherry and peach trees. Um, one problem with them is they look a lot alike um, with a couple of other similar beetles so that to identify them, you really need to have a specimen and be able to have a good entomologist um, who knows that group look at them. Um, and this picture is just showing their exit holes. Um, uh, here's another adult. So the problem I have with the deregulation and why um, the state of Maine and Vermont both asked for um, inclusion in a special USDA program was that USDA feels that they're only found on dead and dying trees. Um, but it's not that clear. That's true that they've only been found on it, but it's not like anybody's looked to see if they um, can also feed on healthy trees. They just haven't seen it. And so in um, England, they feel like this insect can attack healthy trees. Um, this is an image of a declining tree that's been attacked by this insect. Um, over here. So, um, whoops, right. Um, so the USDA feels like they're already established in the country and they've been here for 10 years and nobody's screaming about them. So maybe they're not so bad. So maybe they're not so bad or maybe they just move and act slowly and we just haven't seen what they can do yet. Again, um, you can keep your eye out for them. That would be great if you see beetles crawling on your cull piles, you might just want to grab them and send them to me anyway, so I can find out what they are. Um, and you can look for uh, exit holes or the bugs themselves. And then our um, big problem pest coming right up is a spotted lanternfly. And I don't know how many of you have heard of that. One, again, a sort of good thing about it is that it doesn't look like anything else you've ever seen. <laughs> There's no question about identifying it. Uh, it has quite a few hosts, including um, grapes, hops, apple, pear. Uh, it does like maple, but it seems to prefer red and silver maple. So the sugar industry doesn't have to go crazy yet. Um, it's fairly new to the country. It was only found in Pennsylvania in 2014. So when we first found it, there were a couple of important questions for Vermont, which is, is it cold tolerant? Can it survive our winters? Um, and does it need Alanthus or tree of heaven to complete its life cycle. Alanthus altissima is also a um, invasive species. So as a colleague of mine said, it's a twofer. You get rid of the plant, you get rid of the bug. But it turns out, and this is thanks to um, Pennsylvania State University, which has done a lot of work on this. Um, they are fairly cold tolerant. 
And I found that out too, because I compared the temperatures in January, the hourly January temperatures in Bennington, Vermont, with the hourly January temperatures in um, the county where it was found in Pennsylvania, and they were comparable. So I, I knew it could survive up here if it could survive down there. Um, we've also found out that it, it does not need Ailanthus to survive and reproduce, but it will probably reproduce better if it has that tree. And why this is an issue is we don't know uh, how much Ailanthus we have in the state. And I'll get back to that point in a minute. So this is what it looks like. And I don't know how many of you remember gypsy moth and the gypsy moth infestations we used to get on a regular basis. Um, our last treatment for gypsy moth and last big outbreak was in 90 or 91. So it's been 30 years. We might have one next year because it's been so dry that the fungus that usually kills off gypsy moth um, hasn't been doing its job because it's just not wet enough. But in any case, they have a similar oval-shaped egg mass. Gypsy moth are more beige. These blend into trees really well, but their nymphs are quite brightly colored. So this is a first and first one through three instar. So it hatches from the egg um, as a nymph. That's a first instar. Then it molts two more times. That's second and third instar. And then the fourth molt, it becomes this red, black, and white insect, and then it um, becomes an adult. Um, so part of this pest is that it's a nuisance. It, it's like a giant aphid. Um, you know, it's a hemipteran. It's got sucking, piercing mouth parts. Um, and like aphids, it excretes honeydew, except it's much bigger than an aphid. So it excretes a lot of honeydew. So everything outside gets covered with sticky, ooze, like your kids' toys, your truck, your lawn furniture. Um, and then that sticky material gets sooty mold. So now you have moldy, sticky goo on everything. And while you're trying to clean it up, the stinging insects are attracted to it. <laughs> it's, it's just great. But in addition to that, um, it, it's not a tree killer like our emerald ash borer that we have in the state is. It's um, um, but it, it can damage young plants, uh, particularly seedlings and saplings, and maybe even the small um, twigs on older trees. And I'm not sure that we know the extent of the damage it can do because the reports are still slow in quantifying that. Um, it's definitely um, a problem for the grape industry, for sure. So this is its current distribution. It was first found in Berks County in Pennsylvania. Um, they tried to eradicate it. Uh, they haven't succeeded. And then it's expanded into several other neighboring states. And if you see these uh, purple dots, these are places where individual insects have been found. And then the area was searched and they didn't find any more of them. Well, it's actually, it turns out it's really good at hiding. Um, for example, people would go to spray grapevines where they saw them and the insects wouldn't be there. So it turns out like they feed in the morning and then in the afternoon, they'll go hide in the woods and not just on the edge of the field, but like back into the woods. So I'm sure that these individuals who made it up into New York, Massachusetts and Connecticut um, may well be able to start populations there because they just went and hid. Um, so they're good hitchhikers. So um, again, Pennsylvania has been doing an incredible job trying to train people and issuing permits, getting people to inspect their cars before they leave. But the first spotted lanternfly found in New Jersey, this woman opened her purse and out it hopped. Um, so um, it's almost inevitable that it's going to get here despite the regulatory work to contain it. And one reason I say that is we had a big trace forward in. 2020, and a trace forward is when uh, somebody finds out that they've shipped potentially infested material to other places, and they have to go track where, where that went and alert those people. So in Pennsylvania, there was a company under a compliance agreement, so their staff had scraped all the egg masses off the, the lower, the bowl of the tree, but they had left some on the branches, and those trees were shipped, they were like uh, maples greater than uh, six inches in diameter those were shipped all over New England and a bunch were shipped to a big nursery in New Hampshire, which had sent some maples, not quite as big, 
to Vermont. So I spent the fall running around um, trying to find these trees. Uh, the problem is that the New Hampshire nursery doesn't keep track of where it puts um, lots of plants. So they don't know what was adjacent to the trees they got from Pennsylvania, which had, um, they found at least 14 live insects um, from on those trees from Pennsylvania. Um, so it's fairly low risk, but you know, we don't know. I wasn't able to track down all of those plants. Um, so we'll be putting some traps out uh, this spring and also an alert citizen in um, Wallingford, Vermont found a dead one in a poinsettia in, a, in the Rutland area. Great, all the good news. Um, so one thing that I would like to ask you since you know plants is to keep your eye out for Alanthus, the tree of heaven. Um, it looks a lot like a staghorn sumac. If you know sumac, they have these um, uh, compound leaves and staghorn sumac have those um, pointed sort of red or orange horn-like structures. And the way you can tell them apart is spotted, lan uh, spotted lan yeah. Alanthus, a tree of heaven, has this little divot at the bottom of the leaf with a little gland. Um, and also apparently they stink when you crush the leaves. Um, so we have a website called VT Invasives. Oops, and it's vtinvasives.org, not com. Boy, I better fix that. Um, and if you go to that website, uh, there's a report it function and you can just click on that and you can upload photos and we check and follow up on all of those. Um, other things to worry about? Uh, well, I think I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions, so I'm going to skip the first two, but I'd be remiss as an entomologist if I didn't just mention the Asian giant hornet. There's a far away in Washington state. I really hope they find all the nests and get rid of them. We don't have to worry about them yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature and I'll try to do this. Oh, you can't hear me. Well, sorry. Okay, right. Judy, can you see the Q&A? I can see the Q&A. Okay, can't hear the speaker. Yep. I've answered a couple on the side and maybe I should just kind of in include those. Question about how big is a mature spotted lanternfly? And they're bigger than you think. I said they're, they're about an inch. Um, yeah, yeah, they're a good size. Whoops, try to put my hand here um, like that. You know, they're like a big moth. Mm, mature, but the nymphs are smaller, you know, the, the first instars. Uh, right. But they, that bright color is yep. I think what stands out. But the main thing is looking for the eggs. And then another question that I already answered about the beetle was whether or not it could fly. And in the background, I was Googling to make sure I was telling the answer right. But I mean, you you see the wing covers on there. They, they can fly, the velvet horn beetle. Yeah, the velvet longhorn beetle, yep. Beetle. Um, yes, they can. They they lift those, um, the hardened elytra, those, those mm -hmm. back wings up, and then they have regular wings underneath. Good question. All righty. Well, thanks so much for the chance to talk to you. Yes, thank you, Judy. And that this is the first time you've sort of met with our group, and uh, we'll certainly have you back in the future. It's uh, it's great to have an entomologist who's uh, a capable entomologist at the at the state. So, um, thanks so much. Well, thank you. All right. So All you right, can gonna... unshare here, and we will now prepare for the uh, Vermont Tree Fruit Growers Association business meeting which I'm going to step out because I'm a, I'm an ex officio member, but I'll let Eric take over. There he is. Uh, so for those who were uh, haranguing me about not having the video on, Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, you know, one thing, one thing Judy did not touch on was uh, uh, not to make light of a, a serious uh, invasive pest, but the, uh, the memes on the spotted lantern fly are just hilarious. It's become a, uh, it's become a whole thing down in Pennsylvania. And maybe it's because of the bright colors and the made for TV look that it has, but it is a, uh, it is certainly something, something to laugh at. So, um, we've been posting links to the panelists and not to all the attendees. Um, I'm going to share my screen and Terry, can you bring over the, um, the directors, I guess, would be the most logical thing to do. Or I guess I can watch the Q&A. Let me open that up. To bring them on as panelists? 
I, I guess I'm not sure what would be the most logical. Uh, yeah, why don't I do that? Do here. Let me see. You take me a minute to sort through them, but I can do that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, we'll. This will be a little bit clunky because I was just thinking about what we normally do, and it's. Uh, I have the. Uh, Treasurer's report and the min the minutes from the previous year's meeting on your guys' tables to look at prior to the start. And unfortunately, this is really the only way to do it um, to put it up on the screen. Um, not that we're really going to spend a lot of time for everybody to read through it, but this is the minutes for the previous annual. But first, let's start by calling the meeting to order. We'll call it to order at one o six. Tom, if you've popped over and joined us. Um, I'm making him a I panelist will... right now. Okay. Okay, he's coming. So he can speak now. Yep. Okay. Tom, if you have any uh, comments on your minutes um, or anybody else on the board, I know that these got emailed over the other day. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand or pop in and ask a question. Otherwise, I will take a motion to accept the minutes as they are written. Which I suppose are, are those uh, guys over? Uh, they should be. They just got to unmute and chime oh, in. Got, yeah. Okay. There's a motion in the chat in the Q and A to accept the minutes as written from Lorelai Wyman. Can I get a second? This is Mark Boyer. I second the motion. And blank. okay, any discussion from anybody in the audience or on the board? And the Q and A is a good place to put things. I've got that open right now um, that I can keep an eye on. Uh, Sarah just informed me that I'm sending chats to the wrong people, so I'll fix that. Um, but if you pop something in there, I can make anyone. I think by the end of this, I'll just have everybody being a a, a, a panelist, and then that'll solve all the problems. <laughs> it, it won't create that much chaos. Um, if there's no other discussion, um, all those in favor. You can type by saying uh, the board members or hop on and say aye. I we often do these when we do like faculty meeting, just everybody hop in the Q and A or in the in the chat and just, just yep. say let's do That'd chat. Nice just one. say your eyes. Yeah, show your eyes in there. Um is Zoom or is it Teams that locks onto my share screen? Uh let's see here. So I'm gonna switch over to the treasurer's report. Can you guys see that? Not yet. Okay, let me see. Okay, we're getting eyes. Don't have the sound back. We're getting eyes in the chat and the Q&A, and that's okay. This is okay, that works. confusing enough. No one that said works. no. Give it another couple minutes. Yep. We're coming in. Terry, can you see the uh, treasurer's report, or is it locked on my uh, other it's locked screen? on your, yep, yeah, it's locked on your... Um, on your word doc or on your on the yeah. acrobat okay let's do this so unshare yeah. and then share the other piece that should do it okay we're in Is now that, uh, yep okay. you're good yep um so uh treasurer's report mark did you have any com oh actually we can do the, uh, the discussion part here's the uh Treasurer's report for 2020, um, our ending balance for the end of the year, $25,396.29. Can I get a motion to accept the treasurer's report as written, whether it be... I'm watching the chat and the Q&A for anyone to... Uh, this is Mariah, I motion oh. to accept. Awesome. Thank you, Mariah. All right. Can we get a second, please? This is this is Tom. I have a motion to second. 
That's great. Let's open it up to discussion. Any questions or Mark, did you want to chime in at all on uh, anything that you had in here? I can also run through it. it you scroll down a little bit. There way. you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, we can. We, we saw um, actually a, a very nice increase in membership dues last year, um, as well as uh, vendor fees uh, coming in from the annual meeting too. Um, so, and then on top of that, uh, obviously with the, uh, the straight grants too. Um, so nice increase there. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, we, uh, and just to, just to piggyback onto that, I think I pulled up on the screen here. This is the specialty crop block grant that we've been working on that you're about to hear uh, the wrap up on from Rose. Um, we have currently brought in uh, $6,480 from it's 80% payout. Um, the total grant was 8,100 and I have to check, but we'll bring in the last portion of the payment for that um, as we submit our final report, which will happen shortly after this meeting. But um, our ending balance is a little inflated only because it looks like we didn't spend the grant money yet, but the actual spending of the grant money uh, fell on 2021. So it technically isn't showing up here, but it is, it is actually already out the door. Um, here is our expenses for last year for anybody who wanted to take a look or had any questions. Um, it's pretty standard stuff. And if there isn't any questions specific to the treasurer's report, we uh, can vote. All those in favor, go ahead and say aye. Aye. Okay. And I'll open both windows. And while people can hear me, I can't see Rose. And I don't know if Rose is that phone number on here. Um, if it is, Rose, can you just shoot? Uh, is, is that you in there? Maybe not. Okay, we're going to need to find Rose because she's coming up in a few minutes. Yep. Um, so I will, So if we, I think we've got enough eyes there to close this part out. Um, and I will bring up my other screen here, which will be our last, um, last page here for you guys to look at. Oops, new share. Okay, slate of officers. So as this comes up, Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, we'll move into the next part of the bit. And so new, new, new business and um, largely what we're, you, you're going to hear from Rose shortly about everything we did with our specialty crop block grant leading up to today, the work that she put in for us, the results of the survey from you guys last year um, and that kind of crafted the marketing initiatives that we came up with and then are, then are initiating now. And so our new business will largely this year be around our um, partnership with Vermont Fresh Network, which you'll again hear a little bit more about shortly and will be the large driver in our um, next moves here with the VTFGA. Um, and if you look, if you all are looking and noticing the, we do have a change, some changes here on the board. Um, I will be stepping down as president, but I would call it less of a stepping down and kind of stepping over. Um, my intention isn't really to go anywhere, but to kind of pass the microphone off and let somebody else um, lead the conversation a little bit more. Because I have actually, I believe this is the fifth or sixth year, I kind of have lost track. But um, Jim Bovis agreed to step up and uh, serve as president, which is going to be great. I'm going to slide over into more of a executive director kind of role. And um, at least in the near future, my position will largely be the intermediary for the VTFGA um, and VFN as we move forward with these new kind of exciting marketing initiatives. Um, Mark Boyer has again agreed to be our treasurer and Tom Smith, our secretary. Um, Jessica Yates will be um, coming on for a full term. She was filling in the open slot from last year. And um, 
It's definitely Lowell has also, Lowell has also agreed to come on. And then Kevin Lawyer will be filling in, if you look down in the bottom of the directors, the one year, the one year position, which would be technically being vacated by Jim, who is shuffling up to be president. And I don't know if that's a helpful explanation of the shuffling going on, but um, I think we can do this all at once where we can get a motion to accept the slate of officers and directors as written. And then we can move from there. Eric, this is Lori Wyman. I'll make a motion to accept the slate as written. Thank you, Lori. Can we get a second from anybody? This is Mariah, I second. Okay, um, any discussion or questions from anybody? I can't actually see the chat while I have my screen shared. Yeah, I've got it open. Okay. It's none yet. None yet. Um, and if not, we, all those in favor say aye or type yeah, aye. Ready for the flood of, flood of eyes and yeps. The flood in of the eyes and aye. Then, and then, um, did you see Rose pop on yet? I did. I was looking, Rod. She's under <laughs> Rosalie, and so I was looking for Rose. So it was just a brain thing. So she has gotcha. been promoted to gotcha. a panelist. Um, Great. And um, I, I guess the last, probably the, the, the last thing to do is if, uh, Jim, I didn't know if you wanted to hop on and say anything as we pull in our eyes. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Get your acceptance speech ready. In your, in your, in this, you know, clunky uh, Zoom and Teams meeting world. Oh, is he, the, the, I gotta make him a panelist. He's the person who should be a panelist. Oh no, he is. Okay. If not, that's okay too. We can keep moving along. That was. Uh, we can hear you very, like barely. Uh, is this any better? I think it's fine. only slightly. All right. Well, I don't have much slightly. to say at this point, so I'm glad Eric will be with us uh, moving forward. And when we get out of the Zoom mode, uh, hopefully we can have a little better communication amongst board members and uh, membership. Jay, so, I think that's uh, what we're getting out of him. Can't hear him well. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and if we were completed on that front, if anybody has any other questions, I'm going to un uh, stop share, um, pull it back out. Does anybody have any questions if they're in here? And this, right? And then you put type answer. Right, you know, that how you got into the Q and A. You must. Yeah, oh, you got. Would, you have, you have a chat. chat. Tom, I'm going to mute you. Oh, you are muted. Okay. If anybody, if nobody else has any questions specific to the VTFGA business meeting, we'll just move right along if Rose is ready. Well, I've got, we've got a little break for the, um, oh, for, the for another vendor and I, and throwing a quick Jake Jacobs for a minute to uh, say hi. And then we've got the bit, I think Rose is coming on 125, if I remember right. Okay, well, yeah, sorry. Uh, Jake Jacobs is next. And actually, it will be uh, Gar Thomas will need to be brought over. Okay. Pops in here. Yep, I will bring him up. Yep, I see him. So Gar, I'll, get, I'll make you a panelist now. Okay. So uh, Jake, if you are ready, um, go ahead and uh, we'll close the meeting out at 119. Tom, for record keeping, and we'll turn it over to uh, Jake Jacobs. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, I can't start my video because the host has stopped me. Oh. Because he thinks I'm still wearing my barn clothes and he's not that <laughs> far off. He didn't want you to see me. I'll get you in. There we go. Oh, not a problem. Is that? You're in. Hmm, my... This is telling me not, but can you see my slides? Risk management update, 2021 tree fruit growers meeting. Okay, 
I only have a few slides. I'm just going to give you a very quick update. Uh, I work for UVM. I'm in UVM Agricultural Risk Management and Crop Insurance Education. So we just try to give you the latest and greatest of information that's going to be of use to you. Um, as you know, you're growers, you're in agriculture, it's still pretty risky business. As far as um, tree fruit growing, crop insurance programs, there have been some updates in the tea yields and some of the rates, but they have not instituted um, any program changes at this point. And you may recall, and some of you may have participated in some of the listening sessions that were in 2019 and 2020. Interestingly enough, these were across the country. They were open to anyone with an interest in tree fruit crop insurance programs and products. And the greatest participation by actual growers was at the New Hampshire meeting, which is the location they had for the New England states. The other locations had quite a few participants in the insurance industry, but not that many growers were involved. But the New England meeting, in fact, did have quite a few. Right now, the RMA, um, the folks who are actually administering these policies, RMA, the Risk Management Agency, and the insurance underwriters are working on making changes to the Apple policy. Um, and they're, from what I understand, they're trying their best to include some of the changes that came from grower feedback at those meetings. I was told by RMA a little earlier this month that no changes are likely to made, be made in the near future, and it may actually be 2023 or beyond that before a new Apple policy is published. So I would encourage you to talk with your uh, crop insurance rep and get any update information from them. I want to tell you about just a couple of programs quickly that you may be able to take advantage of. One is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it's, this is a federal program uh, referred to as PPP. There were a lot of people that ignored it when it first came out in the fall. This program is actually offered by the Small Business Administration, but the processing on a local basis is through your local bank or other lender. And the program basically provides loans to help businesses keep their workforce employed during the pandemic. And a lot of agricultural employers really didn't think this program was for them and did not take advantage. One of the very interesting pieces of this is that the entire loan, or at least a portion of the loan, can be forgiven and you may not have to repay any of it provided certain criteria are met. So there's going to be a short Zoom meeting on February 23rd. Um, the presenters are actually some of my colleagues at the University of Massachusetts, um, who also do outreach education and risk management. And they've done program outreach on RMA programs, as well as um, fairly long careers that they retired from in FSA. So they're providing a Zoom meeting to give you some information on this program. And if you go to the UVM Ag Risk website, um, there's a link to the information about the meeting and the link to the registration. Now, if you are doing anything on your, on your enterprise, um, addressing water quality issues, the Clean Water Initiative Program recently provided some funding to the UVM Extension Ag Business and Farm Viability Program. And the whole purpose is just to work with farm businesses who are trying to institute some water quality concerns. And in this program, a farm owner can work one-on-one -on -one with a business advisor, and they'll help you evaluate the feasibility and impact of changes um, that are going to be made on the farm and to your business. Uh, you know that Vermont has very strict water quality goals and requirements. So at the bottom of the sheet is the of this slide is the link to the UVM um, agricultural risk website. Again, the link to that program is on that website. And the third and final program I wanted to 
tell you about is a program that was not available to any but dairy producers in the past. And this is an evolution of that program. It's the farm management team program. And this is a program where the producer or farm owner basically identifies a team of advisors who can provide some input and will help with making some farm management decisions, uh, help them with some overall business planning. And if they have particular issues or problems that they'd like addressed, they'll provide the advice for that as well. And it's really to support a team approach to problem solving and business decisions on the farm. That information is also on the UVM AgRisk website. Um, if you go to that page, this is what it looks like. This is the title page. And over on the right hand side to the right of the, that cornfield, you see there's a title that says news and events. That's where you'll find the information on those meetings that I just mentioned, like the PPP meeting and the links are there. If you actually just scroll down below the picture a little bit, um, the top item in a whole list of options is the farm management team program. And that's where you would find a little more information and the online or printable application. There's no cost for that program to the producer. And I would be happy to answer folks questions about that. It's a program that has not been available to um, any other producer groups other than dairy farmers in the past. And now we've opened it up to any agricultural producer. And there again is the agricultural risk management website. And at the bottom is my email address during this time of remote work when some of us are going feral. <laughs> um, the best way to reach me is really through that, that um, through my email, and then I'll get back to you by phone or contact you however it works for you. And if you have any questions, I can't see the chat right now, but I would be happy to answer them. I've, I've got it open and maybe I'll kind of collate those, but pass it on to our next person and, and pass those questions on to you uh, just in the sake of time. So thank you, Jake. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Gar, we've got a couple minutes for you to, to talk about what you folks have to offer. Okay, I think you can hear me. We can. I can't seem to open up my video, but let me just see if I can share something here. Can you see that? Yep. Well, good afternoon, Vermont. Uh, my name's Gar Thomas. I'm tech service rep for uh, BASF. I cover Virginia to Maine, so not a lot of time only in um, Vermont, <laughs> but Eric keeps twisting my arm to get there. And here I finally got there, Eric, so this is working out well. I just Good wanted to uh, make you aware of a new fungicide from BASF. Of course, you know, we've had everything from Sovereign to Pristine to Marivon, um, but now we have our own DMA or triazole or FRAC3. So for years we've been saying, you know, we want you to alternate our Marivon in home fruit with the best DMA, DM, DMI there for scab and in stone fruit for the best DMI for brown rot. But now we've got our own called Sevia. And there's what the front of the label looks like for um, grapes, poem and stone. It is a reduced risk product, which is a nice category to get from EPA. It helps you predict new wave crops. You know, normally I wouldn't show anything like this, but this actually is from the Clemson was presenting at a fruit workers conference in the mid-Atlantic, and they showed this article from a periodical of toxic regulatory toxicology and pharmacology, and they wanted to point out for some reason that to all other tree fruit extension folks that Sevia was the least, the lowest human toxicity. And I guess the point here is you know, there's already a reckoning going on in Europe with things being canceled. And we'll, we'll see that in the US, but Sevia was designed with a great environmental and tox profile to survive that new regulatory environment that's coming. And we've had it, I've been having it tested from Virginia to Cornell and over to Michigan State for several years now. Um, if you saw the Cornell Fruit School uh, last week, Kara Cox endorsed it. 
right there, you can see Seve at five ounces. The second bar from the left is the best scab control. He mentions that. He mentions it again in his um, summary. And so, you know, for best scab control, of course, we're biased, but would like you to alternate our, our FRAC 711 Maravon with now our new FRAC 3 Sevia. And as if that wasn't good enough, we just got a second wave of new crops. So for those orchards that are running maybe a roadside stand with berries and vegetables, it also can now be used on your blueberries, your onions, your, your root vegetables, carrots, table beets, cucurbits, fruiting veg. That's all, thank you very much. And the package size is a 100 fluid ounce container, which will do 20 acres at the five ounce rate. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's rare that uh, we actually see new products kind of hitting the, the uh, marketplace. Um, all right, we are now ready and a couple minutes over, but I definitely want to uh, welcome Rose Wilson to, uh, to, to the meeting to discuss. And if, if those of you who were here last year, which feels like 10 years ago, um, the Rose was the one who led the, the group together in this uh, kind of visioning uh, of what the, the, the association and the industry would look like in the future. And, and uh, that particular grant is kind of wrapping up. So here's a, a quick wrap up there. And I think Rose, you should have the full keys to the car. Hi there. Um, let me see if I can start my video just so. Um, yeah, I don't know okay. why others haven't been able to start their video. Yeah, I, I cannot start my video, but I was able to unmute. Um, so that, that works. I'll go from here. Um, I'll try to everybody. make that happen. What we thought we would do is sort of just I, I think we more or less reported back to the group sort of as it was happening, the results of our survey, but I'll just recap what, what the goal was with our grant, what we were trying to do and where we're at. So um, we got some funding to look at the strategic direction of our organization. Um, what do our members find valuable about what we do? why do people um, continue to be members of the organization and how can we attract and retain new members? So we created a survey first off to um, basically present to our members, these are the current things that we do for you. What do you feel is valuable about them? Do you feel the cost of membership is reasonable? What would you like to see us do more? Where we have funding to use funding, where would you like us to use that funding? Rose, and, I, yep. I'm going to pop in for a quick second. Yep. Um, I just made you the the host of this whole thing, so I can't even control wow. anything. But I think you can show yourself now. Oh. <laughs> so now you do have go. the keys to the car. Yeah. I can't do anything right. now. Okay. So um, I have all my little um, farm gnomes in the back. Those are my little Norwegian happy farm gnomes. I figure you need to have a fun backdrop when you're doing Zoom nowadays, it gets so boring. So me and the Happy Farm Gnomes are gonna tell you all about our survey. Um, one of the interesting things that we've found over the course of time is that our members are primarily um, pick your own now. So um, they're doing a lot of individual farm marketing as opposed to going through their wholesale channels. Everybody seems to agree that the cost of our current membership is fairly appropriate. And let me see, attendees are now viewing the poll results. So I'll scoot to the pages that I was, I was finding most interesting here. Um, uh, I actually don't know if I can scroll it. It goes to- You should, you should be able to, let me close that out. It stops at question three but I can't scroll further down. Well, those are, oh, do oh, you that's want- a now, you've got a new that's today's going on poll. right now. Oh, cool, yeah. okay. I wasn't sure so what I was doing. So you can share your screen now. I don't think you could before. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Um, share screen. I'll go to our survey. Sure. Okay, so- um, Good. Okay, and I'm gonna move that poll so it's out of my view of vision. Alrighty. Um, so 
I thought that that was really interesting that a lot of our growers are primarily pick your own. So they're really uh, needing to and forced to do a lot of their own marketing efforts. Um, and if we then go to question 10, cost of membership, as I was saying, everybody seems to fairly appreciate the value that they're getting for the um, price of the membership. And if you looked at what do people find most valuable about what our organization does, um, folks really like those technical presentations that we're doing on pest and disease management. So that's good to know in terms of the services that we're offering. And when we asked what additional things could we do, um, folks are really, again, expressing this desire for technical information and um, at this rate also some organic tree fruit production methods, um, some more interest in that. And then uh, when we wanted to say, um, if, if we were to spend our resources, um, folks again are really expressing that technical training. And then the second thing that they're looking for is the marketing. Um, so how can we help market and promote the individual farms? And so when folks were asked our fall specific marketing efforts, um, that was highly uh, desirable. And then again, when we looked at um, if we could help you to market your farm, um, the really big driving force was how to do social media campaigns. We also again looked at some of the services that we've offered in the past. So are you using um, the NIWA monitor? And most people are saying uh, yes, well, almost half. Um, so it's, it's useful to folks. Um, and the folks that are using it do find it very important. Um, and then um, things like uh, receiving supplemental memberships to other things, that was not exactly uh, something that folks have considered as a reason to be part of our organization before. So um, getting discounts to other products or services is not yet something that people kind of associate with us. And uh, lastly, um, and I think this basically just reiterated a question we had asked in the beginning, was that people really do appreciate basically everything that the organization does, um, but especially those technical presentations. So with that information, we then went back to thinking about what could we do as an organization. We're already really good on the technical side. So the thought was, okay, the other thing that people have requested and where the membership is growing is the pick your own operations. So those are sort of the, the new orchards, the forward looking direction of our membership base. And one of the things that most of our members don't necessarily have is the technical savvy or the uh, funding available to produce really good marketing. And so we had some meetings in the summer. And when we looked at ourselves inwardly, we also identified that we as an organization don't necessarily have the technical savvy on staff or on our board to be the marketing experts. But what we did look at and discover is we're actually really good at fundraising. So we said, well, if we're really good at fundraising, if our members need marketing support, if we can get funding to support marketing efforts that benefit our farms and our orchards, and if we also begin to be better at communicating back to our members the value that they're getting and the opportunities that we're offering, maybe we can attract and retain more members and provide them with valuable services. So one of the things that we looked at doing was we created a little marketing plan and we connected with the um, uh, Vermont Department of Marketing and Tourism. And they did agree that they have a lot of marketing opportunities that we can hop on board with. We just need to start being consistent about connecting with them and about um, communicating with our members to get our members actually involved in the programs that are available. And our Apples to iPod actually was an original program that worked in partnership with the Vermont Department of Tourism. And that's one of the most beloved marketing programs that our organization has done. Members continue to refer to it as uh, something that worked really well for them. 
So our thought was how to create some sort of consistency with um, creating a stable relationship with the Vermont Department of Tourism so that it doesn't just become a one-off. And also how can we create um, some opportunity to find and retain the marketing talent needed to help us actually create marketing materials or create opportunities for our members. So one of our thoughts was to have a standing position on the board um, become that sort of marketing liaison where that person themselves may not need to have marketing expertise, but they need to commit to being able to coordinate um, when there's marketing opportunities with whoever our marketing person is, whether we hire a staff person to be marketing, whether we outsource marketing, that we have somebody who's connecting the dots and holding everybody accountable. And, and Eric has stepped up to the plate. Yay. <laughs> so, so we actually, uh, very excitingly, we did start to create this sort of standing position now on the board that's going to take charge of um, making sure that the marketing happens. And then the second thing that we did was we looked at where and how can we access marketing talent uh, and we had some discussions about, well, we could get an intern and a college student. And while that's true, and while those folks might be young and savvy and up and coming and they might not cost a lot, our thought was, again, if you look at where our strengths are, we're good at fundraising. We actually have pots of money. And while we have pots of money, why don't we use them on quality talent? And then the second thing we thought of was, we don't necessarily need a full-time marketing person, but when we hire somebody, we'd like to be able to hire somebody who understands our industry, understands um, our, our market. And one of these opportunities that sort of popped up was this idea that Vermont Fresh Network, who their entire um, skill set is marketing to Vermont tourists and Vermont foodies. Um, and connecting the consumer to the restaurateur, they've actually started to branch out and offer their marketing services because again, they're also more or less a part-time organization and they're trying to create more full-time opportunities for their staff members. So they're looking at what other organizations they can partner with to be your marketing engine. So it just happened that we connected the dots between our association and VFN, and we asked if they would like to be our contract marketing engine. Um, they're also already very familiar with the Vermont Department of Tourism and the Vermont Department of Ag. They do a lot of correlated marketing campaigns already. And that um, has actually taken off. And so I think Eric will be able to share more about um, what VFN has agreed to do, where the organization is at with that. But um, the great news is that we do now have a, a marketing engine that's going to hold us accountable. We have somebody on the board of directors who's going to be able to maintain that relationship. Um, and we have actually quite a few good marketing campaigns in front of us that we can um, hop on with. So we created a little marketing plan. We presented it to VFN. And last I knew, Eric and VFN had... Uh, worked out an arrangement that they've signed on board with and they're actually starting to implement. Um, so it's been really exciting. I think there's a lot of great opportunities now for the organization because in addition to identifying that folks want help with their marketing, identifying where we have strengths and how to leverage our strengths to shore up our weaknesses. And then the second thing is having a marketing engine that not just focuses on actually implementing these marketing campaigns, but that then communicates back to our membership and toots our own horn to our own audience base so that we can gain more members through demonstrating the effect of marketing that we're doing, I think is gonna be really helpful. And that's what I wanted to share with folks in a nutshell. Um, so I will take my screen share off and just ask if Folks, have any questions, thoughts? Oh, or, if yeah. if you can go over in the uh, in the participant list and click on the more by me and make me a host or co-host again, because I can't do any of my background stuff 
since ah, I made you the host. <laughs> more by me participate. List. So if I say, okay, I am. I'm on I the am, panelist list <laughs> in participants. Okay, I'm going to go to participants. I just wanted to, to pop in here and uh, from, from me personally, and, and I, can, I can speak for the board of uh, how much we've appreciated the work that you've done with us, Rose. And you know, this wasn't this wasn't the presentation we were intending to do. We we, we were going to do it, you know, live and in person for the 125th annual meeting. But um, it, it's been it's been a great journey, and um, you know, getting us to the point that we're at now. And I, I speak for myself how appreciative we are of your uh, agreeing to collaborate with us and work through with us on this grant, and bring us to the point that we are today. Um. And then where we are today is kind of what Rose was touching on is we we put this together, we pitched to Vermont Fresh Network. And if any of you guys have ever been over there onto their website or seen the things that they do on social media, it, it's certainly uh, worthy of checking out. It's very impressive work. Um, and so I kind of took our, I took our marketing uh, document that Rose helped put together and I met with VFN at the end of 2020 and kind of pitched this idea to them. And um, we formally signed a contract with them this year, the beginning of this year in January uh, to hire the, you know, their services through this year and kind of launch um, a number of marketing initiatives and that they're going to uh, facilitate for us and keep, uh, you know, keep, keep us on track. And um, if, you know, I wanted to bring, if it was, a, again, a different different time and period, I, I would have also brought Tara, um, their executive director, over to introduce everybody uh, to her and her team. But, uh, you know, Zoom meetings should only go on for so long. So in the essence of uh, time, I, it, we, 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 forego, we forego that this, this time. So um, I've met with them. We've started a bunch of things. It's all, it's, it's just happening now. I actually met with them. It was just the last week that we uh, we formally had our first meeting, and um, there's lots to come. They have an entire schedule for the year already made up, um, different times and places that they intend to to reach out to some of the growers here for information and pictures and start to build this catalog of of uh, stories and. Um, images that they can use for these different campaigns. And it's really, it's going to be exciting. This is one of the, probably the most exciting times for the VTFGA in quite, quite, quite a while. Um, there'll be lots of action and um, you guys will be seeing stuff via email and um, other forms, hopefully on social media of the things that we're doing. And I think at the, at, I didn't have too much else, Rose or Terry. Um, I can certainly, we can open it up to questions if anybody has anything to add or clarify, um, but very excited about the, the, new, the new direction here. So I've got the Q&A and the chat open. People can kind of bang onto either one of those. It seems like half the people here have, I've, I've clicked into panelists anyway. But if anyone's got any questions, I agree. This is gonna be, uh, you know, it's kind of a long time coming and, and you know, there's, there's people smarter than us to, uh, who, who know how to do the marketing thing. Um, so I think it's a it's a great development, and thanks Rose for helping to kind of get our act together, our house in order to to shepherd things along. Oh, all right, I'm supposed to pick everybody. If you have an Instagram account, you we 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 took ownership of Vermont apples, so mm. um, pop on and like or whatever whatever you do there to to add them. So on the side, we can keep discussing this, but I want to be recognize people's time and give them a chance to get their to wrap up their pesticide credit. So I'm going to launch the other poll. The rest of the meeting can kind of happen on the side. So you can drag this off to the side of your screen and we can chat. But the poll is now open. That will uh, when you when you complete this, it will it will show that you stuck around for the whole meeting uh, and you can uh, you are eligible for the pesticide credits that uh, Sarah from our team will submit to the state and you'll get back a little email certificate uh, that says you attended this. So keeping that live. And please be aware that this is a multi-page poll. You'll have to scroll down to answer all the questions. Six questions total. Yep.
Thanks, Sarah, for chiming in there. Well, Eric, it's, uh, you know, I, I was in, this, in, in your shoes whenever long that was ago, seven years or something. Um, so I can say as a, as the former president of, of the tree fruit grower association, you can leave and still be around. <laughs> so. yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm joining the ranks of, uh, still actively participating, but on the, uh, on the sideline, the emeritus. Yes. Right. Yeah. It'll be good. I, I genuinely believe it will strengthen what the board does. Um, pass the microphone around, let, uh, let the board chime in and, uh, lean on those of us who are, on here to uh, to move things forward, so it's going to be it's going to be really exciting. I don't see any other comments or questions. No, nope, they don't seem to be coming in. I think most people are wrapping up, so wrapping um, up. We'll we can wrap this up. But I'm going to leave this poll open a few more minutes. There's five that are on who haven't answered it. Maybe they don't have pesticide licenses. Um, but definitely want to thank everyone. Keep your eyes out uh, for. You know my uh, communications and and uh, certainly everyone else's. Uh, if somehow you got onto this and are not on my email list, which you would have gotten an email this morning, um, if you didn't, uh, let us know. Um, you can holler in the chat, or uh, I mean, everybody's got my phone number eight zero two nine two 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 five nine one. We'll make sure to to, to get you uh, onto our communications list and in the in the group. Uh, yeah, we'll I don't know. The if... Same thing for the BTFGA. I got to update our list. Most, I have mo almost everybody, but every you know, if you send out a mass mailing, um, I get a few pinged back as uh, incorrect or does not exist anymore, and so that will be actually one of the first orders of business is to clean up our uh, clean up our list. Okay, and it says that I've closed the polling. I hope I didn't bump it. I if anyone, I don't know if Sarah closed it. it says if i relaunch polling i'll clear the results so i'm i'm not going to touch anything i'm gonna let this be um if anyone did not get your poll in give us a holler um we can tell who's been here anyway so we'll um we'll we'll check it from there and with that said i think we're pretty good all right all right the darrows you, give you a thumbs up excellent all right, thank you. Now, I'm going to try to get out without closing the whole meeting. I might have been the one that closed the poll because I just clicked the X, not realizing I'm still a host. <laughs> I bet you did. I That's OK. I... That's OK. Um, so oh. we'll let that sit. There's still some uh, things coming. So yeah, do that because we need to download the, the, um, the data, which I think, Sarah, let me know if you can download the, the list that you need to do. Okay, I'm gonna press the leave the meeting, but not the end meeting for all. There you of go. Okay, Try that. bye everybody. It's all been right, wonderful bye, working we'll... with you guys. Bye. I like how you say we too. Like you're one <laughs> of us. I like that. You're you're part of the family. Yay. Thank you, Rose. Maybe just to make sure that I don't mess anything up, how about you take me off being a host? Well, I don't because know. I, I, press, I, 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 I hope press I can leave do that. Meeting, but I'm still here. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay. Assign it. Oh, it's asking me to assign a new host. Yeah, yeah, because it won't let me. Okay. Okay. I'm going to make Terry the host. Yeah, probably make me the host, and then I can download the stuff. So you did stop the. Yep. She's, there yeah. she goes. She's out. Out of here. All right. Um, download. Now, Sarah, I'm going to make you the host because I think you've downloaded lists before, right? Oh, okay. We'll let the media team. Yeah. You know, the the yeah, idea of having the extra Liz, driver in the car. The same <laughs> stuff Liz does for the the other ones. Participant, okay. duration, and uh, poll results. All right. Excellent. All right, they'll get that to us. All right. Now we're just dragging it out. So good to see everyone. And yeah, stay safe. All right. I'm gonna get out. See you guys later. Bye.